So I'm going to invite you to turn with me to the book of Jonah. You also have that included in your worship order. Jonah chapter 3, verses 6 to 10. I've entitled my message, Human Repenting and Divine Relenting. Does it surprise you when people come to faith in God? Are you skeptical of jailhouse and deathbed conversions? Have you become so cynical? Do you perhaps think that some people don't deserve forgiveness? Now this has been on a lot of our hearts. It's been a tough election. It's been a tough year. And there's no doubt in in some of our lives, there are people, as we heard this morning from the book of Acts itself, that at least from your perspective, they prove to be a pest. And you're not sure that they deserve God's love and forgiveness. Well, believe it or not, this is the struggle of Jonah. I don't know what's going on with him, but I know that he does not like the commission he's been given to go to the Assyrians, to the city of Nineveh, and preach forgiveness, hope, peace, reconciliation with God. We'll conclude our series next Sunday, and you will see firsthand in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, he will say, I told you so, God. I told you the kind of God that you are, that you do something like this. You'd actually forgive these people. And I say, thanks be to God that He relents when we repent and He accepts us in His beloved Son. I'm reminded of the words of a hymn that go like this. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word as you're able. I'm just going to pick back up at verse 5 for some context, but... The main point of our uh, main focus of our evening text will be verses 6 to 10. But let's take a look. Uh, This is God's word. It's infallible and errant, and it is for us tonight. Beginning at verse 5 of Jonah 3 The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Verse 6. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published it through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in His hands, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from His fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that He had said He would do to them and He did not do it. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, take your holy word and inflame our hearts with new devotion and zeal. And for those who hear this message this night, who are strangers to your saving grace, gracious God, by your own word, summon them from death to life and grant them the gifts of faith to receive and rest on Christ in true repentance, to forsake all others and to cling to him alone. We pray by your spirit, hear us, visit us, bless us in the ministry of your word. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Human repenting, verses 6 to 9. We read verse 5, and as you recall, that really is a summary verse of what follows in 6 to 9. That verse said the Ninevites believed God. Jonah was preaching. They believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, this is important, from the greatest to the least, Everyone, as a sign of their grief and mourning over their own sin, they put on sackcloth. Now, if any of you have ever put on sackcloth, or in the middle of summer, perhaps a wool suit in Florida, they used to call it a hair suit made of goat's hair or camel's hair. Sacks were made of it. It wasn't comfortable. In fact, it was just terrible. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But this was part of their repenting. They believed God and then began to show those outward signs of what was an inward reality in their life in repentance. Now, repentance and faith go together. They are a single coin with two sides. So often in the church today, one is often emphasized over the other, and it's usually faith. But how can we deny that they go together when we hear from the Gospel of Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe. Repentance is inseparable from faith, being actually the negative aspect, if you will, faith being the positive aspect, uh, that is, repentance being the negative aspect of turning to Christ as Lord and Savior. God's grace gift demands a response. Repentance and faith are the ways we talk about the human side of conversion, our response to God's grace and initiative. Conversion involves a turn from sin to the one who came to save us from sin. Take a look at verse 6 with me. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. The ESV there speaks of him, covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. Would you just take a moment with me and think about a king doing this? Perhaps unprecedented. Kings don't do this. That's part of the wonder of being a king. You don't have to do this. Jonah preached as God directed from verse 2. Remember that? Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. You remember that message? Yet 40 days, Nineveh shall be overturned. Is that what the king heard? Did that bring conviction? What if we only had 40 days to repent? Go. What would you start thinking about? 
And would you tell others about the call to repent? Would you love them like that? The message of yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overturned. The message, Jonah's warning, cut the heart of the king open. That's what the gospel does. You've heard the, the saying, right? The same sun that melts the wax bakes the clay harder. The gospel, the light of God's word and truth confronts the sinner. How will you respond? In repentance and faith? Underneath this idea of human repenting, there must be in repentance the idea of humility. There is a humility to repentance. Look at the four things the king does with me. He rose and stepped away from his throne. The king of Nineveh, the word, verse 6, the word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne. First thing. If he's a king, he better either be going out hunting or retiring to his chamber because if he leaves his throne, that's a picture of a vacuum of authority. He gets off his throne. That's hugely symbolic. What does he do next? Secondly, he removed his robe. Some of your translations say he takes off his royal robes as if to acknowledge that there is another authority, another king. And then it says that he covered himself with sackcloth. So he sets aside his royal robe. He gets off his throne. He sets aside his royal robes. He covers himself with sackcloth. This is peasant clothes, if, if at all. The poorest of the poor wore the cloth that they made sacks into. Can you actually picture a king doing this? I don't even think Hollywood has captured this. Sackcloth. When people did this, there was grief and lament and humiliation and then... Fourthly, he sat down in ashes. That's a picture of self-humiliation. It's a sign of mourning. What is he doing? He's repenting publicly as a king, as a leader. These are outward signs modeling what was going on inwardly, a humble repentance. Do you know what's hard for Jonah? To watch a pagan nation do this. When Jonah knew his own king had misled and caused his people to sin and do evil without repentance, did you know back home, Jonah's home kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel had 19 kings, every one of them bad. No good. Nine different dynasties, 208 years of royal ruin, of rotten rule. No king of Israel did such a thing as the king of Nineveh. What if our national leaders did this? What if they repented like this? What if they asked for forgiveness? and publicly confessed and grieved over their own sin. How much more respect might you have? Their credibility and believability. Their humility in service. You know, that is what is always asked of a servant leader. Always. You lead with a limp. You know where you're weak and you're willing to admit it. The king sets the example for repentance. The elders and the pastors 
set the example for repentance. The husband and the father sets the example for repentance. The grandparents set the example for repentance. The child of God sets the example for repentance. It begins with a position of contrition. A broken and contrite heart the Lord will never despise. Do you believe that? No excuses for my sin. No justifying my sin. And this is what we see in the text. A deep expression of remorse for having offended God. And I'll ask you, do you and I have the same kind of humility, awe, and reverence? Do we feel our own unworthiness before the Lord's worthiness? Repentance got, has to include humility. Verse 7, this is the proclamation he issued, the king issued in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles. And that's interesting. Uh, in the Hebrew, you could actually translate nobles, great ones. The king and the great ones. Make a proclamation and it reads like this. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. The decree is what? Comprehensive. This is not like putting a sweater on your golden doodle. This is sackcloth. No animal wants this. No human wants this. The decree of humble repentance is sweeping in its scope. From the greatest to the least, we saw that in verse 5, people and animals, herds and flocks. To keep a grazing animal from eating, you'd have to do what? Muzzle them. No eating or drinking, abstinence, fasting. Humans can live how long without food? Some people say days, some people say weeks, some people have even argued cases of months. Doesn't matter. How long can you live without water? Three days. You know what's happening here? Repent or die. Don't you think this would lend an urgency to the proclamation to repent? People and animals were to be covered with sackcloth. Daily life was not going to go on as usual. The outward display of all living things in the city would be one of mourning. Whoever and whatever was in that city was under judgment. Forty days and the city will be overthrown. What an incredible picture. We know from chapter 4 there's at least 120,000 plus people. Can you imagine them all being covered in sackcloth? In humility, the king and the people are to take this call to repent seriously. The king took the lead. The question for us is, do we take repentance seriously? There is humility and repentance. Notice then, under human repenting, there's also an urgency. Look at verse 8 as it concludes there. Let everyone, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let Everyone call urgently on God. No one is excluded. Let everyone, let them call out mightily to God. Everyone. No one is excluded from the fast. No one is excluded from the sackcloth. No one is excluded from praying and crying out to the Lord. There's a timely, timeliness to the repentance. Call out now. While today is still today, don't wait. 
Today is the day of salvation. You heard that in the morning sermon. I will live my life and I will sow my oats and I will do as I please and then one day I will turn to the Lord. You fool. Don't you know this night your soul, your life will be required of you. An accounting of your life this night will be asked of you. The call to repentance is one of humility and urgency. And how eager should we be to repent quickly? It is because we maybe have no physical threat. Forty days and the city shall be overthrown. Is it because we are not threatened physically that we think repentance isn't important? Maybe. Maybe we need to ask that question. I don't feel threatened. Therefore, I have time. That's not a mature way of thinking. It's not biblical. Today is the day of salvation. It is a great demonic lie that says, human sin's not that bad. Therefore, I have no need to repent. Verse 8 ends... Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. If there was ever a perfect picture of a people, the Assyrians, one of the most violent, one of the most horrific, one of the most destructive nations to ever live on the face of the earth. The Assyrians, I told you when we started this, I cannot even publicly tell you some of the things that they did to their victims. And I won't. It's too horrific. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Repentance names the sin specifically. It doesn't just go, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sorry for that stuff that I did. Generically. We name it. We drag the darkness into the light. That's what God's word does. That's what God was asking Jonah all along. Go to the Ninevites. Call out against them. Their evil has come up to me. I know of it. I see it. It is before me. And you need to call it out. Go. And there is fruit to this true repentance. In verse 8, in verse 9, twice, in verse 10, the word, let them give up, let them turn is used. Hebrew is shuv. And nacham. Let them turn. Let them turn. You know the term in the New Testament, metanoia, a change of mind, a change of direction. It's a change. You can't keep going down that road. You must make that righteous change. To to repent is to turn away from sin, which in this case includes evil and violence, which they were very much guilty of. This is an essential part of repentance, and repentance that's not just a one-time effort. It's ongoing. It's a lifelong pursuit. We need continually to hear the gospel and repent of our transgressions and our self-righteousness. Metanoia, Lord, help me always to be changing and conforming ever more into the image of your Son and according to your word. Change, turn, turn, turn. And beloved, when we turn to Christ for salvation from our sins, we are simultaneously turning away from the sins that we're asking Christ to save us from. That's repentance and faith. So this repentance is is in humility. This repentance is, is a constant thing. It is sweeping, it is swift, and it is serious. And look at verse 9 with me. That great question. When I read it, did you kind of 
have a little snicker. Who knows? God may yet relent. This is the king of Nineveh speaking. Who knows? Do you know? Can you know? Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from His fierce anger so that we will not perish. Hebrew Nacham. God might relent. This is an interesting word because it means to have inward suffering and pity. Would God have pity and compassion on the Ninevites? On these sinners? And you see, the king has a mustard seed of hope. (laughs) Who knows? In English, you know what that translates into? It's not happening. Not a chance. Who knows? That's what we say when we say, no, it's not happening. Who knows? In the Hebrew though, there's hope. Do you know how God can turn away His anger against our sin, have compassion on us so that we will not perish? The simple Gospel says we can know and do know the answer to the question, who knows? It's the Incarnation, it's the Advent, it's Christmas, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him, they would not perish but have eternal life. Oh, I know the answer to who knows if God would relent and have compassion and turn away His fierce anger that I might not perish. That's a great John 3.16 Old Testament question. And we know the answer. Which brings us to the good news of verse 10. Divine relenting. Finally, there is God's response to repentance. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented and did not bring on them the destruction He had threatened. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that He said He would do to them and He did not do it. Now, older translations have often caused a little confusion here. Are you aware of that? In the King James, it says that God saw their works and they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that He had said He would do unto them and He did not do it. That's why modern translations look at that and they look at the character of God throughout all of the Scripture. Like, let's take for instance a few verses. God is not man that He should lie. Numbers 23.19 Malachi 3.6 For I the Lord do not change, therefore you, O children of God, are not consumed. 1 Samuel 15.29 And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Samuel 1.17, God does not change, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Beloved, God always acts in perfect, perfect harmony with his character. And it's clear from key verses in the Bible, like the ones we just read, God's not fickle. He's not willy nilly. He's not changing his mind. God does not repent. But the idea of relent is a change of a course of action. See, it may appear, notice the word appear, it may appear that God does change, but that's the key, isn't it? Appear. From our earthly temporal perspective, God responds to human action. But from an eternal perspective, God chooses the means as well as the end. So human repenting and divine relenting go together. In repenting, the Ninevites got rid of the reason for their destruction. Forty days, Nineveh will be overturned. This was a conditional or dependent declaration. The conditional judgment is intended to alert. The warning... If they repented, 
then God would respond appropriately to the changed circumstances and relent. Let me put it in plain terms for you. I don't want to pay my power bill. I, I don't want to do that. All right, Chad. Well, you can expect within 30 days you'll get a notice and then we'll tell you that your power will be turned off. I don't like that. You have 30 days to pay your power bill or your power bill will be turned off. FPL has the right to do that. You have the warning and the remedy in the same statement. Pay your power bill or your power will be turned off. Repent or judgment will come upon you. Repent. The remedy is in the warning. And they did that. And God in his mercy and grace can do that. I am so grateful that God relents. That he sees true, genuine repentance and accepts that. What you have here in Jonah 3 is an invitation to repent. And the consequences for not doing that. You see, I don't have a problem with this at all because in the totality of Jonah, why would God send Jonah in the first place if he was just going to destroy them? If there was never any hope for Nineveh, why go to such great lengths to save Jonah and send him there? God can relent, they can repent. Means and ends are met. Why any warning at all? Why 40 days? Why not immediate judgment? Because God is a God of compassion and mercy. Then and today. But Jonah really struggled with his commission, didn't he? He didn't want to see the Ninevites saved. The wickedness of Nineveh was great. The Assyrians were terrible people. They were evil. The body count and the horror of their sin in verse 2 of chapter 1 says, their evil has come up before me. It was legendary. Do you struggle with thinking that you are better than others? That others deserve nothing from God? In 1 John 1, nine, it says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you think that should be told to everybody? What I see here in Jonah 3 is a need for me to repent by turning away from my self-efforts, turning towards the work of Jesus as my Savior. I am to believe God and believe His message that He will judge those who don't repent of their sins, I am to believe the gospel message that he sent his son Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for my sins. I am to believe Jesus when he says that whoever turns to him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that's a message for everybody? Everywhere at all times? You know, the king of Nineveh stepped down from his throne. He took off his royal robes And he sat down in the filth of ash and dust. There was a greater king who stepped down from his throne, took off his royal robes. He put on the filthy sackcloth of our sin. And he sat down and mourned over the sins of of his own people. And he went to the cross so that when we repent and turn in faith to him, God relents and receives us as his children. That's a message for everybody. And I'm so thankful for it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. 
that is always promised to never return to you void, that it will accomplish your purpose, your plan. And Father, when we are honest and we admit that we struggle with those who oppose us, who we may even claim to be our adversaries, and we struggle with whether they're worthy of forgiveness. Father, forgive us, for I am not worthy of your forgiveness, your love, your pity or compassion. And yet you are calling all people everywhere to repent, to turn, forsake the evil ways, and turn to you in faith. Father, forgive us where we need to repent of our sins, strengthen our faith, and we are so very thankful that your Son stepped down from his throne, took off those royal robes, put on that sackcloth of our sin, and gave us instead that clothing of righteousness that only the King of Kings can provide. Thank you, Father, for this hopeful message in Jesus' name. Amen.